designed for learning. And talk about how it's a way to reach out to everybody, not just people with disabilities. So, to start us off, tell me what you know. And this can be anything at all about universal design for learning. What it is, what you use it for, anything. Uh, You're going to let Kathy go first? Okay. Uh, it is a way to design courses so that you don't have to go back and add anything in if you have someone who has some sort of uh, disability. So it's a method for design. So support and design for students with disabilities. Is that a good summary? Sure. Okay. We got one piece in here. What else do you know? Or what else have you heard? Or what else do you think someone else knows? Well, when I think of the term universal, it means it applies in all different platforms, and so that, or in any different subject area. So it's something that can be used for any class, whether it's online or in person or... Cross platforms, cross subject areas. Are those good keywords for you? Yes. Cool. Or any style of learning. Mm -hmm. if, if that's a true center. <clears throat> Multiple learning styles. By the way, you can tell I'm a doctor because my handwriting is very poor. <laughs> so, what else? Matthew's doing it right now here. I guess I. <laughs> okay. That's my challenge to photographers. Is like, can I do the face again? Right. What else? What else do you know? Or what other questions do you have? Why are you sitting in the seat? I mean, I think it's less um, intimidating than just focusing on my students with accessibility issues when I approach it from a universal design. I'm trying to make my class more accessible for everyone. If I give just a bunch of handouts for them to read, that's not going to get everyone. Some people might prefer to see that same document on a video. Um, so it kind of goes with all those things. In the so if I say going beyond the handouts idea? Yeah. yeah. I got room for a couple more things. I, I don't know much, I don't know anything about the universal design, but what I'm thinking is it can serve somewhat like a template so that everyone's, whatever you put into it, it would be sort of a similar format. So you will hit, it allow you not to miss certain areas. So it's a template that, that helps people to stay on track? Stay on track in terms of accommodating. Marcia says that she doesn't know anything about universal design. <laughs> I'm going to take her on the road with me and have her kind of say this at every single point because that's exactly what we're going to talk about today. Fantastic. Um, we have a few things up here. Reaching out to everybody. It's helping students with disabilities. It's a cross platform, a cross subject. It helps with multiple learning styles. You're going beyond your handouts. It's a structurally based approach to things. I want to add two more things to this list. One of them you'll go, yay! And the other one you'll go, uh, can I leave now? So, which one do you want first? Uh, okay. The hooray part. You already are probably doing many of these things that we'll talk about today. Yay! All right, awesome. Thank you, Susan. That's perfect. And uh, that's the silver lining. The gray cloud is adopting universal design for learning is work. There is effort that has to go into it. My promise to you for what we will talk about today is I will show you five things that you can do, and you can do them in the next ten minutes with your courses, each of these five. There are deeper ways to get into each of these five things, things that will take you a couple of hours, things that might be a project for you for a semester. But the five things that I want to share with you are changes that you can make, tasks that you can do, creations that you can put together that will help you to reach out to everybody in your classes, will help to retain them better, 
In other words, the students who start out on day one will probably be the students who are there to take the final exam. And it'll help your students to advocate for themselves. How many of your students come to you and say, Professor Shelley, you know, I'm just falling behind in this course, and I have kids, and I have a job, and I have trouble with the written words, so I'm a little slower than everybody else, and you know, I really need to go to the tutoring center, so could I do that? How many of your people do that for you, right? Almost nobody, I imagine. Students tend not to advocate for themselves, either out of they're afraid to talk to the professor about what they don't know, or they are just too busy trying to cope with their situations. So, we've been stuck on this smiling guy photo uh, slide for a while here, so let's uh, do a little fussing around here. Make sure that I've got this plugged in the right way. Plan B. Yeah. There we go. I'd like to introduce you to a completely fictional and not actually based on a professor at Indiana University person. <laughs> um, and those of you who are fluent in languages other than English can pronounce his name correctly. <laughs> read more books, yes. And Reed teaches detective fiction. He's not actually based on a real person at Indiana University at all. <laughs> And what I'd like to do is, in order to introduce those five things in universal design for learning, I'd like to go on a little thought journey. We talked about the palace of memory. I want to take you on a different thought experiment. Reed is recasting his detective fiction course, and this is what he wants his students to do. He wants his students to read the books, like the Maltese Falcon and the Thin Man, and the Postman Rings Twice. Right? Read those 1940s noir novels, and he wants them to get so engrossed that they go to the library and they find the comic book version of it. And they go rent the movie from Netflix, and they go download the movie from Amazon Prime, and they get so into it, and they just get immersed in that world, and he wants his students really to feel the love of this genre that he is, is teaching them. And this is what his students actually end up doing. <laughs> on the bus, on the way home from work, they maybe are reading the, the required text from, on their Kindle. Um, you can understand maybe that this is not the best way to get into the mood of, it, of that detective fiction world. Right? Um, just for a minute, help me set the stage so, so that we're all in this mental space. What are some words or ideas that come to mind when you think of that 1940s noir, the films, the novels, the time period? What are some things that go along with that world? Darkness. Storm. Yeah, okay. Darkness. The dark and stormy night. Dark. Night. Keep coming. Gumshoe. Gumshoe. There's a detective. The fedora. Fedoras. I heard it. There's a baby. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Femme oh. Curvy ladies, okay. Femme yeah. Fatale, you come. Booze. Oh, yeah, drinking. It's got to be a pie somewhere. It's not going to be smoking. Smoking, yeah. yeah. and then actually a historical smoking at that. Smoking guns. Oh, yeah, guns. Yeah, raincoats. Uh, yeah, trench coat. Suspect. Suspect. You can comment. I heard the word. Police station. <clears throat> what is it? Police station. Weapon of some kind. Correct. I heard corruption. Love it. Antique cars. Ooh, nice cars. Red herring. A false clue. Red herring. Sounds pretty good, huh? Okay, so we're no longer sitting here on an 82 degree Tennessee day. It's 1943, there's a detective sitting in his office with his feet up on the desk and there's an old fan whirring in the corner near the file cabinets and there's a cat on the windowsill and, and he's sitting there and, you know, it was one of those days. And 
And I was, I had nothing better to do, and this curvy lady walked in, she was smoking and drinking, and, and, and she had a, a problem, because see, her husband had been killed, and everyone thinks she did it. The police were after her, and she wanted me to say, she wanted me to investigate, but I thought it was a red herring, I thought it was a false clue, because I really thought she did it, but she was beautiful, and so I took the case, right? That kind of stuff, that's where we are mentally, right? Yeah, you are. All right. Fantastic. Oh, yeah, the... The, uh, Kilos. Yeah, there's some Kilos, Guy Noir. So, although I do a much poorer Guy Noir than I had. So, so why, why am I bothering to do this with you folks? Because what we just conjured up, and by the way, congratulations, I do this exercise with a lot of different folks. This is the most we've ever gotten out of folks. So you guys, you folks are really good at setting the scene, which means you will really get what comes next. So why are we doing this? Because this Kindle device is not a very good thing for setting the kind of scene that we just put into our minds. Right? So, let's follow along with what Reed, who is a completely fictional character, not based on anybody else. <laughs> um, he's recasting his course for his mobile learners. He realizes that his students are going to go into D2L not on their laptops, but on their tablet devices, like they on has here, or on their mobile phones, like I do. Have you ever tried to read a PDF document on a phone? No, it takes a while. That takes a while, that's right, absolutely. Paul is exactly right here. And so Reed has a couple of fears in his mind. I want to just double check. Hey, it's working, all right. Uh, I want to just double check. He has this nightmare about what it means to be an online teacher. He thinks that he's going to have to be on 24 hours a day, seven days a week. When he's good, you're shaking your head, but let me finish out the reason for that here. And you know better. And most of us know better. But there's that nagging feeling in the back of our minds that if students have an idea at 2 in the morning, we should be there at 4 in the morning to respond. There's a few people who do this. They're, they're, there's a few people on my campus who do this. And they say, why don't you do it? And I have a very good answer. Yeah, I, I, I just, you, you didn't hear Paul, but he said, I have a life. It was a very good answer. But Reed is afraid that he's going to have to have, you know, synchronous video in all of his class, plus a chat room, plus the learning management system, plus videos playing, plus this, plus that. He's got to be watching the Yik Yak to make sure they're not talking about them behind his back. They've got to watch all these different channels as he's teaching his online course. He's afraid of it. He hasn't even put his headset on yet in his mind. And so, a question. What is one strategy that Reed could adopt to reach out to the students who are on those mobile devices? Understanding that it's hard to get this when you're looking at this. So how could Reed bridge that gap? Just one thing he could do, big, small, whatever. This is the hardest part, by the way. I heard 16 different things. Y'all came alive at once. This is awesome. So say them again. Email with video link. Because not everybody does Facebook. Video link? Yeah, only those of us over 35 are really on Facebook anymore. So, Oops, sorry, did I say that out loud? <laughs> what else? I heard other things. You know what you were saying? Mm -hmm. I said video app, so give me one. Underscore that? Another still visual. Yeah. Okay. Now you've just said photos. Like I apologize. That angle over here. Still photos here, someone said? If you just had a photo, add audio, so just an audio recording. Which I can also have music. Yeah. Music. <laughs> So as soon as you said music, did everybody hear the Mickey Spillane theme song? Right? Too young. Yeah, well, too young and, and too much getting over the cold too. So, but in terms of all of these tactics, what do they have in common? Sensory. Yeah, they're all sensory. They're all not text, and. They're all well suited to a student's phone or a tablet device. One of the other things they have in common is it's extra work for Reed. 
Reed actually has to make that audio podcast. Reed actually has to do some kind of video. Reed actually has to go out and find a link to some existing video. But we can sleep at two in the morning. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So you guys are on a good track here. And what does it have to do with universal design for learning? Well, let's help Reed. Universal design for learning, um, my CAE said, uh, not real familiar with the concept, so let's just recap it real quick the official definition. And then we'll get off into our own space. The official definition is universal design for learning is a way of thinking about creating experiences for learners, whether they're part of the class, whether they're part of tutoring and support, whether you're in the registrar's office and you're working with learners. Creating experiences for learners, and by the way, You'll have this PowerPoint later on, so if you're taking notes and you just want this, I'll give it to our uh, coordinators, and they'll share it with you after our sessions are done today. But multiple means of learner engagement. In other words, how do people connect with each other in your class or your environment? How do they connect with the content and the ideas? And how do they connect with you as the facilitator, the professor? Multiple means of representing information. This is what everybody talks about when they think about universal design for learning, which is, I have a video, so I have to have a caption track with it. Or I have a video and I need a transcript of it. Or excuse me, I've made a series of lecture notes, text-based for my students. I've got to have an audio version of that for the students who can't get access to it otherwise. And that leads us down an interesting path, which we'll get to in a second. And this is the one that nobody knows about, but is the easiest one to do. We actually talked about it very briefly in the morning session today. And that's multiple ways for learners to take action. And that is, if you have your students always writing their three-page papers, give them the opportunity to give things to you in different formats. I'll tell you a story. It's about Katie. Katie is one of our graduate students at Northeastern Illinois University. And she's studying to be a K-12 teacher. Katie almost dropped out of our program because she was being asked to write 10 and 20 page research papers as part of her education graduate studies. And she was failing at them miserably because her professor said, I really can't make heads or tails of what you're saying. There's not really a logical point. There's no driver there. You're not using details and evidence and examples to support the points that you do make. Your writing is just really poor you're not going to pass the class. And Katie was kind of in tears. Katie came to our Learning Support Center and she said, I'm, I'm going to drop out of, of university unless I figure out something to do. And our folks at the Learning Support Center worked with her. And they're not clinicians. They're not able to diagnose anything. At the same time, they realized that when they asked Katie, well, what do you want to say? She could say it out loud perfectly well. She understood what her ideas were. She was giving details, examples, evidence to support it. And then they said, OK, write that down. And she just couldn't do it. Most of the disabilities that you encounter are invisible ones. It's easy to see somebody with a crutch, somebody with a wheelchair, somebody with a cane. But they only make up about 8% of the population of people who have disabilities, who are among us. And Katie, when the Learning Support Center hooked her up with Dragon Naturally Speaking, some software that allowed her to put a headset on, speak into the microphone, and then it took what she said and turned it into a Microsoft Word document, her professor came back to our Learning Support Center staff about a month after that and said, I have a problem with Katie. She's cheating. Her work improved so much that her professor thought that she obviously was copying from somewhere else. And she is one of our success stories. In fact, she graduated two weeks ago? Yeah, her graduation. So she got her graduate degree. All because the Learning Support Center gave her a different way for her to demonstrate what she was doing. Now, that relies heavily on the disability, the medical model of disability. There's something wrong with you, and so we have to make an accommodation for you. Oh, by the way, I, sorry, I skipped right over my very favorite 
1940s comic of all time, which is Boy Detective versus the Vice Lords of Crime. This, is, this was like every 12-year-old kid's dream. It's like, here I am, I'm 12, I have two guns, I'm defending the curvy lady in the fetish patel in the suit, right? Here's this guy, um, what you don't see down at the bottom is the cop has a cigarette, so there is smoking in here. So, so, you know, you guys are right on target with all the words we were using here. But this is my way to second moment. When we think about universal design for learning, we think about, first, we tend to supporting students with disabilities. Here's my secret tip for all of you folks. If all you are doing is supporting your students with disabilities, then the work that you are doing is extra work. And it's going to sneak up on you. Here's why. I'll argue that universal design for learning means accessibility no matter what. No matter whether your students have a disability or not, or I'll say something like, if your students are adult learners and they have to put the kids to bed and they're studying after that, well, if they're going to watch your videos that you're using to support your face-to-face -face class, they have to turn the sound off. But if they watch the caption track or read along with the transcript while they're watching that video, they can be successful. Your students who are on athletic teams and they travel to other locations. When they're on the bus with that spotty 3G connection in between towns, they can still gain access to materials because if you have an alternative version of your content, they're going to be able to be more successful. For your students who are on active duty military deployment, for your people who are working swing shifts, you know, college students, especially at two-year institutions these days, we're working adults, right? And, you know, I, I was one of them. So, that accessibility means you're making it easier for the broadest spectrum of your students. And I'll get down off my soapbox and get to the five things in just a second. Here. But I want to share something that I heard from Sam Johnson. She's one of the research scientists at CAS, the Center for Applied Special Technology in Boston. David Rose uh, and Sam and a few of her colleagues are the people who came up with the idea of UDL. It started out in hospitals where they needed a way for doctors and nurses to do their professional development quickly and in the same way and without having to come, come off of the shifts and floors where they were working. And so that's where it started. It quickly got picked up by our friends in K-12 education. They've been doing it for almost 20 years and had success with it. And right now, in the past five years, is when higher education has really started to adopt universal design for learning. There's a, uh, a college star, it's a consortium of uh, two-year colleges in North Carolina that has recently said, we are officially just going to do this as the way we do business. My own institution in Chicago, we just recently said, this is our official model for how we reach out to everybody. And when I was talking with Sam last November, she said something that really triggered how I could do this on my own campus. And I hope it, it resonates with you too. The only time I'm ever going to read from a slide for we want a situation that's good for everybody. Part of it is thinking about what has to happen at the level of design that makes accommodation less necessary. And so, let's talk for just a second about two words in there. Accommodation and design. What's the difference? Or what's one? Uh, accommodation is after you've already done it, and design is doing it that's the point, so you don't have to accommodate. Yeah, absolutely, Shelley. That's a good way to start. Accommodation is doing things sort of in the moment. By the way, you all know what accommodation feels like. How many of you folks have had a student come to you, it's day three of your class, and they say, uh, by the way, I need time and a half on the test, or I need some special thing. Yeah. Right? Or I need a note taker, or I have a visual disability, so I need something alternative. How do you feel when you get that request? <laughs> louder, louder. How do you feel? What? Oh, I'm just like, I gotta do something all over again. It's like extra work. Yeah, absolutely. To do something on special. Yeah, it, it, it's kind of frustrating when somebody comes to you with a request for an accommodation because A, it's just for one person, and B, it's work that you weren't planning on doing. And C, you have to do it. The law says you must. So an accommodation is what the law protects people with disabilities with. So if I'm in Marcia's class, and you brought up the field, so I'm going to keep working with you here. So 
It's, it's okay. I'm a friendly and supportive guy. If I'm in Marcia's class and I say, um, Professor Marcia, um, I have a learning disability and it takes me a long time to read the things you're asking me to read. I have this note, official note, that says I need time and a half on the tests. And by the way, I need somebody to read the test items to me. <laughs> exactly, right? Exactly, and, then, yeah. and, and my, my you know, if I'm the faculty member, I think, you know, I don't let them, I don't let that show. I say, no, I, right. I, say I say, okay, okay fantastic, right. we'll work, we'll work it out. But inside, I'm going, how do I do this? Right? What do I do? Who do I turn to for help? Right? That's accommodation. It happens in the moment. It is really extra work, and it is addressed only to one person. So. Here is the silver lining to that challenge that I told you about earlier. If we design the materials in our courses so that they are accessible not only to that one person who comes to Professor Marcia and says, I need help, right? So that they're accessible to a broad swath of our students, guess who gets the help too? That's the so adopting universal design for learning, here's where we get into the five things. Adopting universal design for learning means doing a little bit of work up front that benefits many and helps to reduce the number of people who are going to come to you and ask for a specific accommodation. It won't get rid of all of them. It'll make it less frequent and you will be better prepared when they do come to you to say, oh yeah, we have an alternative version here, we have this, we have that, and so on and so forth. So Reed wants to make, he was listening in earlier with the video links and all those things, and he said, I want to make a video that introduces some of the concepts for film noir and the noir genre of novels and short stories. And so he goes to his media services people at a university that is nothing like Indiana University. And his media services people say, yeah, great, we'll, we'll come, we'll set up a camera in the back of your classroom, you can talk to the camera, we'll have some students there, you can talk a little bit, and that'll be the introduction. And so when Reed wants to make this video, he's thinking about all of these things. And here is what Reed is going to do, and here is what I will suggest you can adopt in order to apply universal design for learning in your own learning situations. And this all has one big old asterisk on it. And here's the asterisk. Don't do this by yourself. There are people on your campus who need to help you with this. Your media services people, CTA team, all of those support services. It's great if you're the bleeding edge faculty member who says, I will do all of this or I will be the shining example for everyone else. Right? Then awesome. Go ahead and do it. For the rest of us, including me, this is a team effort. UDL is a team sport. There's a good deal of work in it, and the benefit pays you in spades afterwards. Every time you teach that course, and after you adopt Universal Design for Learning, you can devote more and more time to the interactions between you and the students because you're dealing with less administrative stuff. You're dealing with less of what, uh, what we just talked about as the moments, right? So here, if you remember nothing else, here are five strategies for universal design for learning. I hope you already know the first few. The first one is starting with text. By starting with text, if you're creating notes for yourself about what you want to say or where you want to go, we already probably do this. In fact, if you have PowerPoint slides for the courses that you teach and you've been teaching for a long time, you probably already have some notes that go along with those PowerPoints. You may have even narrated those PowerPoint slides at one point and put that up for your students. Excuse me. But those PowerPoint slides likely started out as notes for yourself, just reminders to you. Because I have to go through the way back machine. Um, Think back to the very first time you taught anything, right? How did you prepare for that? Made notes. I hear made notes here. I hear made notes here. Tell me about that. What was going through your mind when you were making those notes? 
<laughs> you know what I'm saying? Oh my. Oh my, yeah. They just want to make sure you said it the right time. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Glory to God. Yeah, you want to organize your thoughts. You want to make sure not to forget to tell them this and this and this and this. So if you're like me, I went into that first classroom with a legal pad full of stuff. And I stood up there, and I was the worst teacher in the world. Right? I stood up there, and I read from my notes, and I said, don't remember. Please remember this, and this is important, and do this, and think, think that. And just open up the top of your brain, and I'm going to pour all this legal pad in. Right? Over time, what happens? You get to teach for a little while, and suddenly it's an index card that's a bullet by time, right? And then you get to teach for a little while longer, and you just walk in, and you know what they're going to ask. Because they ask the same things over and over again every semester. You're dealing with perpetual people at the same level, because you teach the same class. And so you get to predict, anticipate. You've got four stories ready. And you can choose from among them to see which one is right. So it's tough to go back to a start with text model because that's where we started out. That's the bad old days of like, remember this, right? So start with text can be actually write out a script and then do it. Or it can be do it and then listen to yourself and write down your script. But having that text first. Having that text as a foundation means that you don't have to make any special effort to have two different versions of everything. And the law on ADA doesn't say that if you post a video, you have to have a transcript, and you have to have captions, and you have to have an audio only, and you have to have a series of still images to go along with it. It just says that there has to be an alternative method. Singular, an. So, the challenge is not I have to do everything when I'm creating media for my courses, but the challenge is I have to make at least one different thing. And that's a meetable challenge. So strategy one is, is start with text. The second strategy is make some alternatives. And this is where we're going with that making of alternatives. Here we have a chemistry professor in her lab, and she's being videotaped by these student workers. She has one of her scholarly articles, a report on her experiment, up on her computer. That scholarly article can turn into a PDF. The video that the students are taking, we can take still images, screenshots from that in order to create a slideshow so that people on low bandwidth things or people who are using screen readers can get at them or people who are on, yeah, I don't know, old phone. But people who are on their old phones can get to it. And uh, this guy in the, in the foreground, all he's here for is to give the thumbs up. <laughs> so all of these various alternatives, you don't have to make six different alternatives in order to be doing universal design for learning. Just one alternative is usually plenty. And that will help reduce the number of specific accommodation requests that you get when students come into your learning environment. So strategy number one is start with text. Strategy two is make alternatives. The third one is let them do it their way. This is the one that people really like and people really resist when they first hear about it. And we talked a little bit about this earlier today. So if I'm asking my students in my health sciences course to give me a report, I can ask them to give it to me in Microsoft Word as an audio or to ask students to go to a place and report on it with a video. As long as the objectives for the assignment, as long as one of those objectives is not must have one inch margins, any of these three is an equivalent. So I'll read this out. What is the effect of chocolate and cocoa flavonoids on plasma, lipids, and lipoproteins associated with cardiovascular disease? Or in plain English, chocolate makes your heart feel good. Awesome. This is exactly right. <laughs> Chocolate is good for your cardiovascular health. Fantastic. And these these species here are equal signs. Mm -hmm. Now that's the you know that's the whole joy of grading something like this is if I'm telling my students give me a bunch of five page essays or seven page essays, by the time I'm done with them, I'm kind of glazed over a little bit. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. And if I have my students actually demonstrating the skills that I want and they're giving me some video, some audio, some Microsoft Word documents, 
It's a variety for me too. And I see that they actually get it. They get more engaged, they get more involved. Would I do this for every single assignment in a course? Probably not. There are times when you do want to assess all of your students using exactly the same yardstick. But where you can find opportunities to give your students some choice here, you, you get away from Katie's story of my professor wants this 20 page paper and I can't write it. And you move toward actually figuring out what are those outcomes that you want to measure. So strategy one was start with text. Strategy two is make some alternative strategy. Three is let them do it their way when you can. Strategy four, this is a very bad visual pun. For those of you who know uh, lots of good film noir movies, this is 1939, Alfred Hitchcock. So don't know it? 39 steps. 39 steps. Yeah, this is a really bad existentialist play of the 39 steps. There are seven ladders here with 39 steps. We have the requisite fedoras and trench coats, and yeah. the words are still here. Um, but underneath the visual pun here is the idea of chunking things up. And this is something we talked about a little bit earlier today, too. And that is if you take your 50 minutes worth of lecture capture from your course, and you post that online for students, we talked about what happens at minute 48 and 20 seconds. And, uh, and your students won't be able to know that. But if you chunk that up into a two minute section here, a five minute section here, seven minutes here, four minutes here, and you say, this is video one of 10, two of 10, three of 10, so on and so forth. Two miracles will occur. Miracle number one, your students will actually watch them. Miracle number two, they will retain more of it because they'll watch a few of them over and over and over. These help with student retention generally. It's not just a strategy for students with disabilities, but for students who have learning disabilities, and which often includes attention challenges, having a two-minute version of something that they can watch repeatedly really helps with, with engagement and memory. So if strategy one was start with text, strategy two was let them do it their way, excuse me, strategy two was alternatives, Three is let them do their way. Strategy four goes step by step. Strategy five is set content free. And I mean this in two different ways. Set content free from the clock so that somebody says that we could go to bed and not be up at two in the morning. And so what that means is even if you're teaching a face-to-face -face class that only meets you know, for 50 minutes three times a week, or you have a night class every Wednesday night for three hours, the outreach that you can do with your students when you're not there, when you're not physically in that room, helps your students to stay on track. Now, all of your content that you put in to supplement your face-to-face -face course, you want to make it so the students can get access to it outside of the clock, and we talked about that over here earlier on. But you also want to make it so that students can gain access to it without having to have a specific piece of software. I used to say that you can't look at Microsoft Office documents on your phone. That's no longer true. You can download Microsoft Office viewer apps for mobile devices these days. Excuse me. But in terms of accessibility, the gold standard, and this is one of those 10 minute things, the gold standard is to give people content in a format that doesn't require them to have any specific piece of software at all. So you remember those narrated PowerPoint slides that you've got rolling around in the back of your stuff? Take those narrated PowerPoint slides and play them through an application like Camtasia, like Jing, VoiceThread, Screener, Screencast-O-Matic. Take your audio stuff and put it through Audacity. <coughs> You can then host that audio and video up onto YouTube or onto a, a sharing site like Flickr. And those sites, you don't need a specific thing to be able to play that video or that content. So if you were to share your PowerPoint slides with your students in desire to learn that means that they have to have PowerPoint in order to open that stuff up. That's getting less and less so. Desire to Learn now has those little readers that will automatically transform it for you. Well, 
But again, have you tried to read a PowerPoint on your phone? Mm -hmm. So being able to turn things into videos gives you, again, two advantages. One of them is people can get to it anywhere, anytime. And two, you've got built-in tools in most of the things you're using that will help you with captions or alternative versions. And if you were starting with text to begin with, you don't even need to put the captions in nine times out of ten. You upload the transcript that you already created or the script that you already created, done. That's not the 100% uh, gold standard. Everybody wants captioning and things, but if you have to have a quick and dirty choice for making things accessible, post that alternative version. So those are those five strategies, and I want to spend a little bit of time. I propose them to you here. I hope you're doing some of them already. And I'll put them up here on the, on the screen real quick. You start with text, make alternatives, multiple ways to demonstrate, break things up into components, and expand and share your interactions using those free or low-cost tools. Everything I put on the screen there is a piece of shareware. So you can start out using those tools for free, and then you can talk to your CTAT folks and talk to your media services folks and see what fancier stuff they have for you if you like those. So let's take a, a, a minute back here. I almost don't want to erase this. This is the best anyone has ever done. Here, I'll take a photo. Gonna, yeah, please. I'll please. take a photo. I was awesome. just want to know, are we going to get badges? <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Are we going to get back? I saw that. I would make some badges for you. <laughs> awesome. So, so Kathy is our witness, right? Everybody else who comes through this room, this is the thing to be. So, and I am loath to get rid of that. So, <laughs> so let, let's get it because I'm, I don't want to erase that because I want to still stay in that mindset. We still have that smoky, booze-soaked 1940s. Oh yeah, wool pants. Ugh. So. <laughs> But let's check in with Reed. He wants to make his video, right? And so he, he went to the library and got all of his, uh, you know, Kiss Me Deadly, Double Indemnity, Postman All Those Rings, Christ, got all the movies. And so with Reed, how can he apply those five strategies to his unit on hard boiled fiction, especially with that video that he wants to create? Now that you're dangerous, now that you have those five things, let's help him out. What could he do? Remember, strategy one was start with text. Second one was make some alternatives. Third one was let them do it their way. Fourth one was step by step. Awesome. The fifth one, set content free. See, you got this other thing. It's awesome. So, what could Reed, who is completely fictional and not based on anyone at Indiana University, what could he do with his normal course? Start with the points he wants to make. Outline. Make sure that they give the students the outline. Give the students what they're going to need to know or what they can study from. We can see what uh, services are available at his university. Like in terms of um, technology stuff. So, you know. I'm going to team it up. He's going to go to, uh, it is the CTLT at Indiana University. Oh, no, it's not. Sorry, it's fictional. Um, but uh, yeah, he would, he would find out at whatever institution he's at. Anywhere university. Yeah, anywhere university. And he would figure out who can help him do what he wants to do. And what could he want to do? What's manageable? What could he do, you know, that's a little bit of planning but not a ton of work? Mm. Or start with a ton of work and we'll walk it back. <laughs> <laughs> I would maybe have students film their own noir scene because that would be an assignment that would be easy enough to create but would require them to do the same amount of work as a written assignment in many cases. And they could do it, it could be really short, they could do it on their, you know, phone or YouTube or something. That's a double win for the professor in this case. And Abby, I like the way you're thinking about this because if the professor is asking the students to create their own scenes, hey, watch this movie and recreate one of the scenes, or even twist it up and say, recreate one of the scenes if the plot had gone differently. Yeah. 
right? Write your own special alternate ending, something like that. That's a win for the students because they're not writing a paper necessarily, or they have the option to do that. Also, the videos that the students create, guess who's not creating those videos? <laughs> the professor, right? I love farming work out to my students, I really do. Because they get a benefit and I get a benefit. The good ones, I say, hey, can I, can I have permission to use that again? And then I have a library. Hey, this is what former students have done. By the way, did you, did you notice when I said, you, you guys did the best here? You're all like, yeah, yay us, mm -hmm. right? A, it's the truth. You are, this is the most we've ever had. And B, you're investing in it now. You're like, I want to, Kathy even took a picture, right? I want to see what the other people do. They're not going to come up with as much as us, right? <laughs> so having that student motivation, that student engagement, having that in there is really key, especially if you're working with multimedia. What else can we do? Well, I'll tell you what I always think is, it's like the teacher version and the student thing. Uh, make a video that it describes the assignment to them in the format that we're done with more novels. Like have the professor with a you know, hat and say, well, something's going on in you know, such and such a town. Uh, how are you going to find out? Well, if you want to know who done it, you're going to have to read it. So they don't taste out there or whatever. So, so are you sure. suggesting that the professor actually have some fun? Actually, I love that. The, 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 and, you know, getting into one of the, remember we were talking about what Reed wants his students to do? He wants them to get so into it that they go beyond yeah. the class. Yeah. Well, one way to get students to get into it is to get into it yourself. One of the things, and, you know, it's, it's tough when it's in a freshman English course, or a composition course, or an intro math course, and those kinds of things. And those are especially the points where if we show engagement and enthusiasm, students will respond. So, and it also gets us back to when we first started teaching in a good way, that we remember what it's like to have a spark about a particular topic. So I really love the way you go. I was just joking around earlier. So. What else can we do? Some of it takes work to get into work. <laughs> Explain more about what you're talking about. I, I think we have to expend energy at the outset to generate energy, re 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 reciprocal energy from the student. I think that's right, and I also think that the energy that we expend can be done in a smart way. That if we are trying to design the learning experience for our students, for that broad swath of students, we're going to end up in a better spot. We're going to end up with better product, and we're going to avoid largely those specific accommodation requests from learners. So we've hit on multiple ways of engaging the students, keeping them on task and excited about it. We've talked a lot, actually, about giving students multiple ways of expressing what they're learning and what they know. What about multiple ways of presenting information? The stuff that we know how to do right off the bat. How do you know? Um, I do this already with my Comp 2 class, but if I can, I like doing a novel where I know there's a readily free, like audible, like like a, a YouTube free audiobook or something. Because mm -hmm. so many of them, I had a bunch of nursing students this past semester, and they all have the ability to, you know, stream it somewhere. So they would put it on at, you know, some of them worked at the same hospitals I too, who would just put it on at work and listen to it and, or, you know, would listen to it in their cars or whatever. And that's not even something I have to do. I just have to find the free link. Yeah, I, I was, was just going to say, how much extra work was that? It was five minutes of trying to figure out choosing resources that are already accessible. In many cases, other people have done the work that we're thinking about doing. Other people have already made things accessible to us and to our students. And being able to give students that option, here's a devilish question, and I'm asking because I, I don't think the answer is yes. But do you think that the students who are using that audiobook are somehow not really doing the course, that they're missing an opportunity to read? that we're not really giving them a chance to do deep inquiry by giving them an alternative like an audiobook? I mean... That's an evil question and you don't have to answer. I think, 
I mean, I had, so once, like, two semesters ago, I had a student who was literally legally blind, and in that case, I, I mean, that was the only way for her to have access to that information, so in that case, certainly not. But I think my question usually is, were they going to, and it's kind of avoiding the question, but my question is, if there's a choice between are they listening to the audiobook and nothing, it's usually a choice audiobook or nothing. The choice isn't really for them audiobook or reading mm -hmm. in a lot of cases. So in, would I rather they all be sitting there, like, taking notes on every page and, like, riveted? Yes. But if they're if the alternative is well, I'm fine with that, let me know who they are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but for a lot of them, you know, they're going to do what they know takes the least amount of time or what they have time for. And so for them, you know, it might just be if the alternative to them listening to an audiobook is I'm just going to read this on random Wikipedia. I'll take the audiobook every time. Yeah. Like it's a it's a degree of. <laughs> So, I mean, and no, I mean, I, the students this semester, anyway, it worked really well with. I mean, it was clear that they had slow read because they had to do an in-class essay um, at some point, and it was clear that even though students were using the audiobook, I mean, they weren't allowed to use any outside sources during the essay, and they had, they had clearly read. So, or they had read for purposes of that audiobook. So I, I'm skeptical, but it worked well, so. <laughs> but I, I think we forget that the written word is a fairly recent thing, that stories, are historically from storytelling. And an, auto, an audio book is just a current version of that. So to think that we're getting less from an audio book than from reading, I don't know, is a fair assumption. And, and if the student is an oral learner, which uh, not the majority, the majority aren't, but they're there, they're in the classroom. You don't, they don't have green noses and dead ears, but. Uh, and the other thing that occurs to me is an investment of time. The student's time is invested in hearing that audio message like it would have been writing the message or writing. See, and this actually gets us back to one of our challenges where I want to point to, and I love you all, I want to point to a red area in the thinking about universal design. And that is, we can very easily, and I asked my, my devilish question on purpose, and having you respond beautifully, and it even sparked conversation, so awesome job. I asked that question the way I asked it on purpose, because we can very easily get into the, I am defending the ivory tower and we must hold these high standards conversation. And if part of the high standards is, all of my students must learn to read deeply and with sustained attention, then a lot of these alternative ways fail. Just on the face of it, they do. If the objective is, can my students demonstrate the skills that I want them to demonstrate, like that, all roads lead to Rome on this one. And like Abby, one, one thing that you said early on when we were talking, really struck home. You said you had a student who had a visual disability, and for that student it was the audiobook or nothing. And in that case, you didn't feel like that student was somehow cheating or somehow not demonstrating all the competencies in your class, right? So why would we feel that way about students who do have sight? Why would we feel that way about you know, other students? Now, I'll, I've painted a nice silver lining. Let's put a cloud with it. <laughs> There are courses, objectives, and competencies that we want our students to have that can be gained only through sustained attention to longer texts. In those courses, I would never recommend, let's water it down. You're teaching a philosophy course, you're teaching a critical reading course, those kinds of things. I would give students alternative versions, and I would say, hey, by the way, I want page numbers. We're all using the same edition. Let's actually work through it. And only those students who need the accommodation will use those alternative versions. So my suggestion to all of you is not that universal design for learning is some panacea that solves all of our problems and levels the playing field for everyone. Because there are bits and pieces. I teach business writing as one of the courses that I teach. And in business writing, for some god-awful reason, we still teach people how to write memos. When's the last time you got a paper memo on your desk, other than from the president or the provost, right? 
and we want one inch margins. We want Times New Roman. We want the header over here. We want tabs at half an inch. We want uh, this subject line. We want your signature at the end, but we don't want a dear salute salutation, all that kind of stuff, right? We want people to get straight to the point. We want them to make the request. We want to have a call to action at the end. If this brings back bad memories of business school, I'm very sorry. For that assignment, I can't ask my students to give me a video. I can't ask my students to demonstrate that skill in any other way because the format is the assignment. In Abby's class, I will imagine you're teaching comp and rep. Some of those assignments, they've got to write a paragraph. They've got to write a three-page essay that does have details, evidence, and examples to show their critical thinking. So in those cases, don't give them lots of options. But it's where you can. That's, what, that's actually what the law says in terms of accommodation. You know, the thing we shudder at, the extra work that creeps up on us when we don't see it coming. In terms of accommodation, we have to do whatever it is that the law says to level the playing field for that one person. But in terms of universal design for learning, we take little baby steps. We put in one more alternative version. We give some <coughs> choices on a, a test, a quiz, an assignment. And we test it out with our students. Your students will be the ones who will tell you, hey, this was awesome. I really appreciated having that flexibility. Or it was great that you took an interest in keeping me engaged. So we've got some good stuff up here for what we can do with his, his students here. Let's wrap it up with a, a little bit of actually using it and where you can actually apply it. Remember the warning slide? There will be more than seven words and seven lines. This is it. But this is the web address, and you'll get this PowerPoint presentation later on. But it's udlonline.cast.org. That's the base URL for CAST. They just put together a site specific to higher education. Almost all of the resources on their site up until last year were for K-12 folks. And they are just now really getting into higher ed and working with adult learners, people who have work responsibilities, family responsibilities, military learners, and units. And what they do is they go through in much greater detail than we can do in a 90-minute workshop. And they have checklists of, here are some ideas that you can actually put into place in your course. They have a tool where you say, I teach business. I teach nursing. I'm an allied help. I teach math. I teach English. And it rolls you right through. Here are some of the things that you can do in the next little bit in order to be successful with your courses. <laughs> so there's a worksheet out there that you can use right in the next 10 minutes. And by the way, almost everything we talked about up here, these are those 10 minutes to two hours kind of things. Also, you're in very good company when you adopt universal design for learning. San Francisco State, Carnegie Mellon, Northern Colorado. This is the College Star Alliance of two-year colleges in North Carolina. You folks who are uh, at our two-year colleges, Look these folks up at College Star. They have resource guides. They did the work for you, and you just follow the resource guide. Kind of nice. And so there's a lot of different places where you can go. And again, you'll get this later on, so I don't want you necessarily going, hey, what do I need to do right now? Go get it. And my last point here before we open up some conversation is I'm in the north. So what if you've never seen slush, this is snow that's been combined with salt and exhaust from cars and things like that. So I took this over the winter time, and uh, I was at my local grocery store, and you'll notice here's the cart return, and it's in the disabled parking spot. Nobody sees that underneath all the snow, and then I point out people go, what? So I sent a tweet and to the corporate Twitter account, and I, I just took a picture, and I said, Hey, Jewel Osco, not cool. Five minutes later, we are calling the store manager right now. <laughs> so it's not always this easy to spot when you need to make some changes. So the changes for universal design for learning that I'm suggesting to all of you are things that you can use now. 
you can plan for in the future, and I've heard some good things so far. So before we wrap it up, let me hear your thoughts. And I also want to point to a resource. If you look in your packet, you have a handout with regard to what you can do in the next 10 minutes, 10 days, 10 hours, so on and so forth. A whole bunch of, uh, whole bunch of Rome State color ink on it. And, and uh, the, the, fun, the fun part of that is if you flip to the other side of the second piece of it, uh, all of those, oh no, it's not on there, I apologize. I will send your coordinators up for the EdTech Academy the version of this that has the links active in it, so you can just click on it in the PDF. So just having this is nice, but it will also be nice to have a clickable version of this. And the other thing that's in there, I have to, I have to both apologize and be proud of. It looks like a Chinese takeout menu. And uh, for those of you who have uh, Asian heritage and descent, this could be a tricky kind of thing. So I have to apologize for being a little culturally insensitive. At the same time, this is an estimate of how long it takes to do a lot of the common things in universal design for learning. And you know how this came about. I was thinking, well, how can I share this information with people? And my system administrator, Kenny, and I were talking. And, and I said, yeah, you know, like we've got things under engagement and demonstrating skill and presenting information. And it's, you know, it's all just a jumble of things in these three columns. And Kenny says, yeah, you could do it like a Chinese menu. You know, choose one from column A and one from column B. And I said, yeah like a Chinese menu. And so this document was born. And the most difficult part of putting this together for me was finding the chili pepper character in the font. <laughs> Holy smokes, I went through 14 fonts. But I did find them. And those, and those chili pepper, the red hot ones, those are the ones that have more impact for your students, more direct impact. <laughs> and so we estimated about how much time it takes for a lot of these strategies. So. As you're looking at these documents, let's wrap up with a little bit of shout out, a little bit of future planning. What kinds of things, I, I hate to leave the noir behind, what kinds of things in your own courses, in your own experience, in your own student support, do you think you're already doing now? And do you think you want to adopt coming up? What sparks, what ideas are coming up? And take a few minutes, look around in your sheets here, just go on out and have I love doing PowerPoint videos. I did voiceover PowerPoint videos. I planned out what I was going to say on each slide. So I already had the script. Mm -hmm. Then I uh, played the uh, PowerPoints, inserted the voiceover in PowerPoints, turned it into a video, shot it up on YouTube, put my script up there, and it automatically did it, and it's great. It's 100 well. It's 98%. There's always, you know, you misspeak when you're talking. You mm -hmm. so anyway. well, and, the, and the YouTube automatic captioning mm -hmm. um, loves people like me. People with Northeastern accents, men with deeper voices. Yes. If you are a lady, or if you have a higher voice, or if you have an accent that is not from the Northeast, be careful with the auto captioning in YouTube. You'll end up getting <laughs> weird things. You're absolutely right. But there are a number of different places that can help you with captions. So, so the uh, PowerPoint to YouTube, bro? Yep. Well, she uploads her. I upload, upload she my script, too. Oh, awesome. So yeah. you have a comment that at Southern Ballet. Yes, it yeah. certainly does. So, and, and then it actually, when I uploaded my script with all the wonderful punctuation and everything, it is almost like it's closed captioning. Oh, fantastic. I mean, it oh, is. Wow. Like I oh. said, 98%. Awesome. So Kathy is already doing this, so that's awesome. What things are you also already doing or thinking about doing? Did that spark any ideas here? I've been trying to figure out ways for my students to choose formats. Um, I teach chemistry, which is difficult, so we're primarily exam-based. So I've been trying to incorporate a verbal portion of the exam, which no one's really 
took a loving to that. So this semester, I gave them the option to do the verbal exam portion or to create a tutorial video nice. of a topic. And everyone chose the tutorial video portion. Uh, I'm a big fan of edgy creation, so I asked them to make it on that and share it with me. And, um, but still, as a chemistry person, it's a little difficult to figure out how to let them choose their format. Did, did they do a good job with the tutorials, by the way? Uh, yeah, for the most part. I mean, when they missed the boat, it was more of a content missing the boat. Like, the videos themselves are really good. Cool. Yeah. Well, and two, if you're in the hard sciences, and we all talk about freedom and creativity, and you're like, no, no, there's one way to do this process. <laughs> um, the freedom and creativity is not around necessarily the process or the concept that you're giving them. Freedom and creativity can be in approach. So I like the tutorial or study guide. If the demonstration of skill is you gotta know the stuff on the exam, then put the freedom in way early in the process. Where it's, you know, create a study guide or um, come up with a series of questions or write your own exam or work in that way. And that way you get you get them sort of loose and free range early on, and then you tighten it in as they head toward the exam. I guess I'm just not a big fan of just the straight paper exam. The sciences, it's just, it's like taking a foreign language. It's just as hard to hear it and to speak about it. So I keep trying to figure out a way to incorporate that. I do a lot of iPad stuff, so I've been considering going to an iPad based exam so they might be able to have a verbal question from me on there. Cool. Like yeah. And two, in terms of demonstration of skill, uh, especially in a lot of the hard sciences and social sciences, being able to have a video of a student performing a task correctly is a, a huge plus. So asking your students to take the more traditional part of the exam and then the after exam exam is go apply it and send me the video and I'll critique it. So that's a good thing. I see. Our students, our students have, I'm, I'm in nursing, and our students have a lot of good a lot of content that they have to go through and they're testing on the end of the semester. Mm -hmm. In this past semester specifically, I found that a lot of students have difficulty understanding and applying the concepts that they're learning. Mm -hmm. um, we did my search this past semester. And they can read through the text, they can don't assign the symptoms or whatever condition it is. But when it comes to, let's see, give us a little scenario in an exam, they're having trouble sitting out and in, in finding the priority, what, what priority action. Um, so I'm, so I'm sitting here trying to think, okay, how do I... Please finish your thought. I wrote down mine. Oh, no. <laughs> His mind is on the board. Um, I'm just I'm sitting here trying to go through, you know, figure out, okay, how do I, how how do I approach it from the foundational level? Because I get them as soon as they come into the program, and I have them in the second semester. So, are they pretty good at doing learn and recall sort of in the moment? Like they see it and then they try it out, but then when it comes time yes. to the demonstration later on, they fuzz it. Yeah, or even for the test when they're mm -hmm. when, when I'm trying to get them when we're trying to get them to apply. So one of the things that we can do in the moment that's really universal design for learning is chunking up not only the information we're presenting to them, but chunking up their demonstration of the skill. And so if you're if the demonstration takes the form of a nurse supervisor watching a patient interaction then as they learn those individual skills, have a micro exam that's a nurse supervisor watching them with just that one thing. And then they get used to, okay, this is how it's being assessed. And then they see six of those. And then when they have the big demonstration at the end, they say, oh, I know how to do this. I already know how to do it. It's four right in there. Same thing if your demonstration at the end is largely paper-based, if they have to do a knowledge check and do a traditional examination. After they learn one thing, give them the questions that might be on the exam or you know, questions that are close to it, but only three of them. And use the same format for the exam, use the same paper, the same this, that, the other, the same tools. And so they see it in miniature and they practice in miniature and that gets them used to the exam itself. So one of the things that UDL really helps with is test anxiety. 
people get into a situation where it's not like we're in class, it's not like I can just play around with it and try it, this is for all the marbles. This is a test. I'm sitting here and I'm not allowed to look at my neighbor's stuff. And people freak out when that happens. And, you know, we, we want our nurses not to be freaked out of the people. We want, them, we want them to be comfortable and assured and know what they're doing. So one of the ways to do that is to, uh, yeah, to, to chunk it up and give them little experiences of what the final thing is going to be. It's an awesome idea and a good question. What other sparks are coming up for you folks? I really got to see a few people looking up and to the right. That tells you you're going into your long-term memory. By the way, that's how you can tell when you're playing cards with somebody else if they're bluffing. <laughs> they're looking, they're typically looking down into the left. Mm -hmm. if, if, if somebody's got you a false hood, they'll go like this. Right? They'll look down into the left. Most people. There's a few people their long-term memory is down to the left, but you, your eyes move in certain ways. You know, it's called saccade studies. S-A-C-C-A-D-E. -E. Another fun thing if you want to Google it later on and play around. <laughs> Well, you know, I think uh, one of the impressions I have is that a well-placed single uh, photo, like like the one you shot, and giving a student time to think about what they're looking at. I, the age of videos, videos are powerful, but they don't—they're all just constant motion. But you know, you, if you sit there and look at that long enough, it, forty years ago, IBM had a placard it just said think. And you see the business office everywhere. Think. You know. and, uh, so it seems to me well placed uh, single shots and and greatly add to students thinking um, And I'll actually expand that out to say that if you're adopting universal design for learning, yes it's nice to adopt it at the broadest level of the course. But you're going to get banged for your buck by adopting it at specific assignments, at specific points. You know already where your students often have the most questions, where they always misunderstand, where they always goof things up, or they're not quite sure about things. Those are the places to do this because it helps unlock things. Because what you're talking about, Paul, is sustained attention and repeated attention. So students can go back to a still image and examine it much more easily than they can for a video. Students can watch a two-minute video clip over and over again much more easily than they can find that two minutes worth of video in your 50 minutes worth of lecture capture, which is why chunking things up is so powerful. So fantastic idea here. So, so I think one of my concerns, I guess, with this is like, if you look at my D12, it already looks crazy. I mean, just because I have so many, I have my own practice things. I have my online homework I have to get them to. You know, I have, a, some, I have a few videos. So I'm worried that, you know, if my, I have this practice problem as a PDF right now, if I go ahead and make a video of me working it and trying to encourage it, you know, if I start making all these duplicates of these assignments in there, then it's going to make my D12 even more overwhelming than I think it probably already is. Let me suggest a sub-practice here, which is called big and small. In visual design, people will follow the structure that you've put in something, whether that something is a book, whether it's your online course, whether it's your syllabus, what have you. So if you already have a cluttered closet full of stuff, which most of us do, the design that you utilize, and this is where the folks at CPA team and the media services people can help you, is for a, think about a primary way in which students can move through your content. If that primary way is read a bunch of text, that's fine. If that primary way is watch all the videos, also cool. But make those things the biggest and most visible things in your course. So if you have a bunch of videos, put in the little streaming video pictures where you click on the still picture it calls up the video. And then if there's a transcript, down here in the bottom corner, have a little link in smaller font that just says transcript. Right? Think about when you buy an airline ticket or when you buy something on Amazon. Right? 
If you want to see the item, you first get all your search results, right? Or yeah. all the air, all the flights that you could choose from, or all the copies of Taylor Swift's new CD, and they're all on a list, and there's little pictures of them, right? So everything is sort of equivalent. And then once you choose where you're going, things get big and small. You get a bigger picture of the item on Amazon, or you get the flight information on the airline's website. And then what you get in smaller type is, select the dates when you want this, your flight. Or do you want this as a CD or on vinyl, or you want the MP3 now? And those are smaller links. So bigger and smaller really helps to take a cluttered closet full of things and turn it into a structured path for students because you lead them visually through. And you can also use tools like the checklist tool to say, here are the required elements. Before you even get into seeing everything, at the top level, right at the top of that folder or that module, you give them a checklist and say, here are the things you need to do. And for this one, there's two things you could look at. Choose one, either one. For this thing, there's two things. For this thing, there's only one. So on and so forth. And when students go back to that checklist, that'll help keep them on track. But those are, that's a really good design question because universal design for learning can mean 18,000 things. And it's really confusing for students, so I'm glad you asked. Does that help to address what you're getting at? Fantastic. Well, we have a few minutes left here, and uh, I'm a big believer in feedback. So as I'm passing these around, uh, I want to say thank you first. Where's my, where's my thank you? Please go to thank you. There's thank you. You've been a fantastic bunch of folks. You guys did the most noir words ever oh, of anybody. Yeah. Give yourselves a pat on the back for that. That's fantastic. And what I'd like to would like to do is while I'm passing this around, do you have any ideas, questions, concerns that just in general about this topic? Did you learn something today? Is there enough here that you want to learn? Sure. Sure. Yes, um, again, it has to do with content. Huh? Our, our students are required to be a ridiculous amount of uh, information. Yeah, that never happens anywhere else. <laughs> no, but I mean, it's, it's, it's a, a lot. lot of, it's a lot of information. And I'm, I don't go through every specific section that is in the shower of my the past the day trying to lecture. Uh, my question is recommendations for condensing that and sort of um, Let me see if I hear your question right. Your, your students are expected to read an ungodly weight of information. Lots and lots and lots. Right. And they're expected to know that information and apply it right. in situations that actually affect the mission outcomes. Right. So this is not, oh, I got it wrong. This is somebody gets sicker or I forgot to do something. So they do need to know all of those things. In that case, the work that we can do as faculty members is to start at the other end of the telescope. We have this body of knowledge, this body of information and ideas. But we start at the other end of the process. We start at the outcome. And we say, OK, what are the behaviors and ideas that I want my students actually to demonstrate? And then I work backwards from those, and I say, what information do they need to know to demonstrate this one, that one, the other one? And so out of a unit's worth of seven different professional readings in nursing journals and medical journals, I might end up with a set of ten behaviors and outcomes. They need to know how to establish patient rapport. They need to know how to set a pick line. They need to know how to uh, move a patient safely. They need to know how to uh, do emergency airway response. Okay? I'm taking from 12 different units in every nursing course right now because I'm not a nurse. But you get the idea, right? You have those specific behaviors, and then for each of those behaviors, you can start pointing backwards to here are the pieces that they need to know in order to demonstrate those things. And then as you're lecturing, you cover three quarters of those pieces. 
and you make reference to the other piece. Or you put the other piece on the exam so that they're demonstrating everything that you can see. By the way, when Sachs comes knocking on your door, your department chair, your dean, says, by the way, it's accreditation time. How are you demonstrating your teaching professional skills? That's where you turn. Those assignments where you have already mapped out the specific behaviors and outcomes, and you now know what the knowledge is, and you can say, this student's got the knowledge and demonstrates the skills. This student's got the knowledge and demonstrates the skills. This student didn't, and here's what you did about it. Then your response to Sachs is a much easier one. So I'd encourage you to turn that telescope around, and your folks at CPA team can help you with that strategy. So awesome question. Thank you. That's about all the time we've got for our session today. You are off to other really good ones. I'll leave the fishbowl up here if you want to send them back. Thank you again for having me, and I hope the rest of our sessions are good. Take care.